today we'll have first concluding lecture. Uh, this lecture is about hollow organs and today we'll compare different organs of different systems. We studied different systems individually and now we'll compare and we'll find the similarities between different organs and systems. And here we can see different systems of organs which are present in our body. There are digestive, respiratory, urinary, reproductive, male or female, nervous, endocrine, immune, cardiovascular, sensory system, skin or integumentary system, and musculoskeletal system. And they provide different functions, but also they have a lot of similarities in their structure. And we can divide all these systems in some groups. First of all, uh, we have visceral systems. They are systems of internal organs, uh, including digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive systems. They form viscera, which you studied at anatomy as viscera. They are organs uh, which provide vital functions of our organism and they provide support for entire organism. So digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive systems, they are called visceral systems. Also, there are somatic systems. Soma, it means body, so they form our body. It's musculoskeletal system, uh, it's muscles, um, articulations, bones, cartilages, uh, ligaments, tendons, etc. And also there is skin integumentary system which covers our body. So there are somatic systems. And all those systems, visceral and somatic systems, are regulated by regulatory systems and also sensory systems. So there are nervous, endocrine, immune, cardiovascular, and sensory systems. Nervous system provides a nervous regulation. Endocrine system, it provides endocrine regulation. Uh, immune system provides immune supervision. Cardiovascular provides nutrition. It provides transport of different nutrients and support of different uh, systems. And sensory systems, they, um, organs of sensory systems, they receive information from outer environment and give this information to nervous system. And they provide uh, this stage of nervous uh, regulation. So there are regulatory and sensory systems which provide regulation of somatic and visceral systems. And here we can see visceral systems of inner organs, uh, digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive systems, uh, female and male. And those systems, they have a lot of similarities in their structure. Uh, you already know a lot about their anatomy and histology. But now let's compare those organs and see, let's find the similarities. So the organs of the visceral systems may be divided into two major groups. They are hollow organs, tubular or luminal organs, and glandular or parenchymal or solid organs, two basic groups. And uh, hollow organs, they have cavity or lumen, and they have wall. Here we can see stomach, esophagus, intestine. They are examples of the hollow or tubular luminal organs, different ducts, different uh, tubular bag like uh, structures. They are hollow organs. And also, there are glandular or parenchymal or solid organs. Uh, they have tissue uh, which is composed uh, of solid structures. And they haven't lumen, they haven't wall, they have solid tissue. So liver is an example of the parenchymal or solid organ. So here we can see two groups of organs. And uh, first group is hollow organ, and this lecture will be about hollow organs. And the next lecture will be about parenchymal or solid organs. So today we'll pay attention for the hollow organs and we'll discuss their common structure, common similarities, and also differences between different organs of visceral systems. So here we can see uh, as an example of uh, hollow organs, a uh, group of hollow organs of the digestive system. Uh, it's pharynx and esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and they form digestive tract. Here we can see digestive tract, which begins in the oral cavity, and they form this uh, hollow tube-like structure. And uh, they are example of the hollow organs. In other systems, they also have uh, hollow organs. 
And, for example, the digestive system, it also has glands for solid parenchymal organs. So systems, they may have both types of the organs, uh, hollow organs, such as digestive tract in the digestive system, and also uh, glandular or parenchymal organs. In the digestive system, they are salivary glands, liver and pancreas. They aren't hollow, they haven't full, they have solid tissue. Uh, and uh, on the next lecture, we'll discuss these solid organs. And uh, now let's look at the general features of the structure of some organs. And uh, let's go to the common structure of the hollow organs, hollow internal organs of the visceral system. So here we can see this digestive tract, and it's composed of the hollow organs. Uh, and uh, hollow organs or luminal organs, they have cavity or lumen, and they have wall, which separates this lumen. And this lumen may contain different contents in the digestive system. Uh, it's food uh, in the process of digestion. In the urinary system, it's urine. Uh, in the respiratory system, it's air. So different content may be present in the cavity. And wall, wall has layered structure. And uh, usually wall is composed of three or four membranes or layers. Here we can see membranes or layers. So if you see hollow organ, which has cavity, which has wall, uh, also you should know and you should list layers of the wall of this hollow organ. So usually there are three or four layers. Uh, three is inner middle and outer, here we can see three layers in middle and outer, inner lines, the cavity, middle forms the wall, and outer it covers the organ. Uh, here we can see inner, outer and middle layer, and sometimes there is an intermediate layer, fourth layer, it's uh, located under the inner layer, so we have inner, intermediate, and uh, middle and outer layer, uh, additional fourth layer is present in those organs. So, or three layers are present in the organ, or four layers may be present in the wall of the organ. And uh, inner membrane. Uh, the innermost membrane, it directly lines the inner surface of the organ. Here we can see it, and it's in contact with cavity of the organ. Uh, so it contacts with uh, content of this organ, its inner membrane. And in the organs of the visceral system, it's always called mucous membrane or tunica mucosa. Uh, its surface is moistened uh, with a layer of mucus. That's why, it, uh, that's why it's called mucosa. So uh, in the uh, luminal or hollow organs, the inner membrane is called mucosa or tunica mucosa. And uh, in stomach, uh, in uh, trachea, in uterus, um, and the ductus deferens in all those organs, the innermost layer is called mucosa, tunica mucosa or mucous membrane. Uh, keep this in mind. Uh, it's the innermost membrane. Uh, and mucosa uh, usually has own layers. And uh, the layers of mucosa are three or two layers. Usually it's epithelium, it's obvious uh, layer, uh, it lines the mucosa, it lines the inner cavity of the organ. So the innermost layer, it's mucosa. Of mucosa, it's epithelium, and epithelium is different. And uh, mucosa, usually entire mucosa, provides the main function of the organ. So mucosa, it's those layer which provides the function of the organ. And also uh, lining of mucosa, it's epithelium, it's specific. And uh, the exact function of the organ is provided by epithelium. So uh, epithelium is specific part of the uh, organ which lines mucosa and it provides the functions for this organ. For example, in stomach there are cells, epithelial cells in the lining epithelium which provide production of hydrochloric acid. In the uterus, epithelium produces mucus. Uh, so this epithelium it's specific part of the organ, and you should uh, remember features of the epithelium of each organ. But the common feature that uh, the innermost layer is epithelium. Under the epithelium, there is a lamina propria, its underlying layer, its thin layer of loose fibrous connective tissue. Here we can see this lamina propria, it underlies the epithelium. Uh, 
Connective tissue always follows the epithelium. It always underlies all epithelia. So epithelium cannot exist without connective tissue. And connective tissue, it is located under the basal membrane of epithelium. And in mucosa, it's called lamina propria. And this lamina propria, this connective tissue, it contains blood vessels, nerves. It contains lymphatic vessels, nerve endings. Uh, so they provide a functioning of the epithelium. They provide nutrition, support for epithelium. Epithelium has not blood vessels, own blood vessels. So it receives all the nutrients via diffusion from the underlying connective tissue. So under the epithelium, there is lamina propria, loose fibrous connective tissue, which provides support for epithelium and which provides uh, uh, nutrition and protection of the epithelium and it forms this layer, forms the shape of mucosa. And also there is a third layer of mucosa, it's muscularis mucosa, it's very thin layer of uh, smooth muscular uh, tissue, here we can see it. And mucosa, muscularis mucosa, it's located under lamina propria, it separates mucosa from submucosa. And muscularis mucosa should be distinguished from muscularis, the next layer. Uh, so muscularis, it's much more powerful layer and it's well developed layer. It's uh, next layer. And muscularis mucosa, it's very thin layer. And uh, this layer, uh, contractions of smooth myocytes of this layer, they change uh, the folds of mucosa and uh, they help uh, to form the relief of mucosa. So it's very thin layer, it's sub layer of mucosa. Uh, and here we can see three layers. So let's make a summary. Mucosa, the innermost layer of uh, different whole organs, it has three layers. It's epithelium, it's different in different organs. It's lamina propria, it's uh, usually loose fibrous connective tissue in different organs, and muscularis mucosa. And in some organs, muscularis mucosa is absent. Here we can see this muscularis mucosa and it's absent in some organs. Uh, and in those cases, we cannot see clear border between mucosa and the next layer, it's uh, submucosa. So let's look at submucosa. What is it? Uh, what do we know about this layer? Uh, submucosa is located under mucosa, it's intermediate layer and it separates inner and middle layers. So uh, usually organs, they have three or four layers. So when they have three layers, submucosa is absent. Mid inner, uh, middle and outer layers are uh, present, but intermediate is absent. In some organs, it's present. So what is submucosa? Submucosa, it's organ, uh, it's layer, which uh, is located in the organ uh, under mucosa between mucosa and middle layer, which is usually vascularis. So here we can see submucosa. And it forms a macro relief of internal surface of the organ. It forms usually folds. And they have different uh, shape, different direction. So there are uh, folds of submucosa. Here we can see those folds. And macro relief, it's visible uh, without microscope. Uh, so we can uh, see it on the anatomical level. And here we can see transverse section of the esophagus, and here we can see folds. And basis of those folds is formed by submucosa. Here we can see mucosa, it's epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis. And deeper uh, we can see submucosa. And uh, it forms the core of the folds. Uh, and those folds in the esophagus may be longitudinal in the stomach, they are in different directions. In intestines, the folds are circular. Uh, in the urinary tracts, they usually are longitudinal. So those folds, they are formed by submucosa. It forms the basis of the folds. And here we can see uh, four layers, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis uh, in this case, and the outer layer. Uh, here we can see macro relief folds are formed by submucosa and mucosa follows those folds because it has the same thickness in all uh, parts, almost the same, and submucosa it forms the folds and they form macro relief. And let's look here. Uh, submucosa it forms big folds, macroscopic, which uh, can be uh, seen without microscope, but also mucosa, this thin layer, innermost layer, it may form 
own structures, it forms micro relief. Some mucosa forms macro relief visible without a microscope, and mucosa it forms micro relief of the organ. And this micro relief is visible uh, without is visible under microscope. And this micro relief is specific in different organs. So there are maybe villi, crypts, uh, pits, glands. They are formed by mucosa without some mucosa and they are uh, visible under microscope and they are specific according to the uh, organ. So it's micro relief of mucosa. Micro relief is formed by submucosa uh, and it's followed by mucosa and mucosa it forms own relief it's called micro relief and also in some cases uh, submucosa is absent and in some textbooks in some organs you can find that this organ uh, has mucosa only or mucosa and submucosa so uh, why those uh, differences are present uh, the border between mucosa and submucosa is this thin layer it's muscularis mucosa uh, mucosa it has lamina propria, it's loose fibrous connective tissue, and submucosa uh, it's um, also loose fibrous connective tissue, probably a little bit denser than mucosa because it forms the core of the fold. And uh, between them we can see clear border, it's muscularis mucosa. But in some organs, muscularis mucosa is absent. And in those cases, we cannot find the clear border between lamina propria of mucosa and submucosa because loose fibrous connective tissue uh, completely transits from lamina propria to submucosa without border. And in those cases, some uh, textbooks say that submucosa is absent in those organs. For example, urinary bladder and urinary system, it usually has it, uh, muscularis mucosa. Uh, digestive and respiratory systems, they have muscularis mucosa, but urinary uh, system, it hasn't this layer, uh, and oral cavity also hasn't this layer. So in those cases, um, uh, there is a uh, decision of this question, is there some mucosa or not? If mucosal folds are mobile, this mobility is provided by some mucosa. For example, in oral cavity, mucosa is mobile, it moves above the underlying tissues. So we say that in those places, some mucosa is present, but uh, we haven't a clear border between lamina propria and some mucosa. But in some cases, mucosa is fixed to the underlying structures. For example, on the gums, gingiva in the oral cavity, uh, heart palate, uh, mucosa is fixed to the underlying tissues. And in those places, mucosa is immobile. And we say that some mucosa in those places is absent. So if mucosa is immobile, it's fixed to the underlying tissues, it uh, uh, results in the absence of some mucosa. And for example, in urinary bladder, urinary bladder it has mucosal folds, they are mobile, but in the region of triangle of the urinary bladder, uh, some mucosa is absent and mucosa is fixed to the muscularis and it hasn't folds in those places, so in those places some mucosa is absent. So uh, it's how to distinguish between mucosa and some mucosa. They form inner lining of the organ, uh, they provide the main functions of the organ, and in some cases we cannot find the clear border, so if mucosa is mobile, uh, we say that some mucosa is present. If mucosa is immobile and fixed to the underlying tissues, we say that some mucosa is absent. So, Mucosa and submucosa, they are inner and intermediate layers of the hollow organs. And uh, here we can see it's micro relief, it's formed by mucosa only. Uh, for example, in intestines, uh, they are villi and crypts, and submucosa, it forms the basis of mucosa and it forms macro relief. And now we are going to the middle layer, to the middle membrane of the hollow organs. Here we can see it. It's usually located under mucosa or submucosa if it's present. And usually it's muscular layer. So most often it's muscular layer. Uh, in the digestive system, in the urinary system, there is a muscular layer. In the reproductive tract, uh, male and female, there is muscular layer. But there is one exception. It's respiratory system. In respiratory system, uh, middle layer, 
is fibrocartilaginous respiratory system present muscles in the middle layer it has uh, cartilage and fibrous membranes in the middle layer so usually it's muscular layer middle and in some cases in some systems it's fibrocartilaginous and a uh, muscular layer it provides peristalsis of the organs here we can see a uh, wall of the uh, organ colo organ for example it's intestine and there are muscles and um, food comes here uh, and muscles are contracted and they form peristaltic wave and this peristalsis moves the food through the lumen of the whole organ. So here we can see peristalsis, its main function of the muscularis. Uh, and uh, here we can see intestine and food passes through this intestine and peristalsis helps to move this food. Here we can see this movement. And uh, that's why uh, systems which have peristaltic movements, they have muscularis. Uh, they are digestive system because uh, food passes through the lumen of digestive system. Also, urinary system, peristaltic movements, they uh, help to release urine uh, to the outer environment. And also, contractions of muscles, they form sphincters, they act like sphincters and they prevent uh, urination uh, when urinary blood is filled uh, and we should wait for uh, the urination. So, sphincters. Uh, they are working and also in female reproductive tract uh, peristaltic movements they help to move spermatozoa to the place of fertilization to fallopian tube and they help to move um, they go to the cavity of uterus after the fertilization in male reproductive tract peristaltic movements they help to move spermatozoa and fluids so uh, those organs they have muscularis and one exception, it's respiratory system. It has fibrocartilaginous layer because it keeps the lumen open. And a respiratory system, that's why it hasn't muscularis in the middle layer. It has fibrocartilaginous because uh, imagine what uh, will happen if uh, trachea will have muscular layer, prostatic contraction of trachea, and we cannot breathe. That's why uh, there are cartilages which keep, they maintain uh, lumen open in open condition. Uh, so that's why a respiratory system it has fibrocartilaginous layer, this middle layer. And the outer layer or outer membrane of the hollow organs, it covers them and it may be of two kinds. It may be serosa or adventitia. So uh, first of all, uh, adventitia, what is it? Adventitia, it's uh, connective tissue which surrounds the muscularis or fibrocartilaginous layer here we can see it and it's loose fibro connective tissue which transits into connective tissue which surrounds this organ and neighboring organs and uh, there are organs which aren't covered by serous membranes and they have adventitia but also there are organs of abdominal cavity which are covered by serous membrane it's peritoneum and also there are pleura and pericardium pleura covers the lungs and pericardium it covers the heart so serosa uh, it's a serosal membrane which covers the organs and uh, in the luminal hollow organs peritoneum which is attached to the surface of the organ it's called serosa and here we can see organ, it has all layer of connective tissue and additionally it's covered by serosa, by peritoneum. So in these organs, where they are covered by peritoneum, we call, we say that they have serosa in this place. And organs of abdominal cavity, they may have different localization according to the serosa. Uh, some organs are completely covered by uh, peritoneum. Here we can see peritoneal covering of intestine and its mesentery. Uh, so this localization, uh, it's called intraperitoneal. And this organ, it completely has serosa. Only in this place, uh, very, very small part, it's adventitia. This localization is called mesoperitoneal uh, when organ has one uh, wall which is uncovered by peritoneum and three of four, uh, three quarters of the organ are covered by peritoneum. So it's mesoperitoneal localization and in this place organ has serosa in this adventitia. So we can see that some organs they 
have particularly cirrhosis, particularly adventitia. And this low organ, it has retroperitoneal localization, so only one quarter of the organ, only one volt of the organ has peritoneal covering. So in this place it has cirrhosis, in this place it has adventitia. And uh, organs, for example, intestines, which are covered by cirrhosis, they have smooth surface because cirrhosis, uh, it's um, covered by mesothelium and it's smooth uh, covering. And organs uh, which are immobile, uh, such as the fagus and others, they have adventitia and adventitia is fixed to the neighboring organs via connective tissue. Connective tissue connects different organs and that's why this tissue is called connective. Uh, so those organs which have adventitia, they have rough surface and they aren't so smooth as organs which are having cirrhosis. And histology of adventitia and cirrhosis. Adventitia, it's simply layer of loose fibrous connective tissue. It also has blood vessels, nerves. And cirrhosis, it has additional layer. It's the same connective tissue, but also it's covered by thin layer of simple squamous uh, epithelial cells. Uh, so uh, it's simple squamous epithelium, which is called mesocilium. It's outer covering of cirrhosis. Here we can see it's adventitia and it's cirrhosis and it's outer cirrhosis membrane. So um, when you study histology of different organs, you also should uh, remember their anatomy and especially they are covered by peritoneum. If the organ is covered by peritoneum, it has cirrhosis. And uh, let's make a summary of the typical structure of the hollow organ. Uh, the hollow organ it has four or three membranes. Uh, the inner membrane of the organ uh, is mucosa. The next layer uh, is submucosa. Mucosa it has three layers: its epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis. Submucosa uh, is loose fibrous connective tissue as well as lamina propria. And in some cases, muscularis mucosa is absent, and we cannot see clear border between lamina propria and submucosa. Uh, and both layers are similar. Uh, the only difference is uh, bigger density of submucosa. And submucosa it provides mobility of mucosa above the underlying tissues. Middle layer. Uh, is composed of muscular tissue, usually inner uh, layer is circular and outer is longitudinal. Uh, so here we can see those uh, layers. Um, and in some cases, uh, this layer, usually this layer is uh, composed of smooth muscular tissue, but in some organs, uh, this tissue is skeletal. Uh, and it's straight it's skeletal tissue and it's voluntary, but usually it's involuntary. And the outermost layer is adventitia or cirrhosa. It may be different in different organs. So we can describe typical hollow organ, uh, which has typical features of the structure. And as an example of this typical organ, we can describe a small intestine, jejunum or ileum, it, uh, they have the simplest and the most common structure without any features. So they have uh, mucosa, which is composed of epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis. They have submucosa, muscularis, which is composed of smooth muscular tissue, inner circular and outer longitudinal, and the outermost layer is cirrhosa. It's the typical structure of the whole organ. And uh, we can describe this classical or typical whole organ. And in other organs, we'll compare to this diagram, to this uh, pattern of the structure, and we'll compare uh, and find the features of the structure. So let's uh, go to the different systems, and we'll begin from the digestive tract. It has the most common uh, type of structure, and uh, let's look at the parts of the digestive tract. So there are uh, four membranes or layers of digestive tube. Uh, it's uh, mucosa, composed of three layers, epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis. It's submucosa, it's muscularis, with two layers, and cirrhosa, adventitia, or cirrhosa. It's uh, membranes of a digestive tube. And let's look at different organs. So, first organ, it's the and pharynx. 
they have a lot of similarities and let's look at the structure. So here we can see esophagus, uh, it's transverse section of the esophagus, it's um, uh, mucosa, it's epithelium, lamina propria, muscularis mucosa, it's submucosa, uh, muscularis or muscularis externa and adventitia. Adventitia because esophagus isn't covered by uh, peritoneum only in this place where it's located under the diaphragm, it's uh, a little bit covered uh, by peritoneum. So in this place it may have uh, cirrhosis. And uh, epithelium of esophagus is stratified squamous and keratinized. So it's the first feature of the esophagus if we compare it to typical organ. Next feature of the esophagus is presence of the glands in submucosa. Here we can see those glands, and in typical organs they are absent, so its features are proper glands uh, of the esophagus, they are located in submucosa. Uh, let's look at muscularis. Muscularis uh, of typical organ is uh, smooth muscular, uh, but here smooth muscular tissue but in esophagus, it uh, has particularly uh, smooth muscular tissue, particularly skeletal muscular or striated muscular system, uh, tissue. Uh, why? Uh, in upper parts, in pharynx and in upper third of esophagus, there is a, a skeletal muscular uh, tissue which is voluntary. And deeper in the middle uh, third of esophagus, uh, there is a smooth muscular tissue and it's mixed with uh, skeletal striated muscular tissue and in the lowest third uh, esophagus has completely smooth muscular tissue. So uh, there is a gradual transition of muscular tissue uh, in the different parts of esophagus. In upper part uh, there is completely skeletal muscular tissue in middle uh, mix of two tissues and in lower part smooth muscular tissue. Smooth muscular tissue is involuntary and uh, skeletal uh, straight muscular tissue is voluntary. And uh, this voluntary muscular tissue, which is present in upper part of esophagus and in pharynx, it provides uh, swallowing. Uh, when we swallow, uh, we need uh, voluntary muscles. We need uh, mind control over those muscles. That's why upper part of esophagus, it has these muscles. Uh, it's also a feature of the esophagus. And the outermost membrane is adventitia because uh, the focus isn't covered by peritoneum. Only exception is the uh, two uh, or three centimeters above the cardiac region of the stomach. Uh, the next organ, uh, hollow organ, is stomach. Here we can see it. And uh, let's look at the structure. So here we can see layered structure of the stomach. Uh, the uh, epithelial covering, it's simple columnar epithelium, here we can see it, and this epithelium, it has ability to produce mucus, uh, it's feature of the epithelium. Uh, epithelium of stomach and mucosa of stomach, it forms gastric pits, here we can see um, gastric pits, and uh, also there are gastric glands, here we can see gastric glands, they are simple tubular unbranched usually. Here we can see it's uh, lining epithelium of stomach and there are gastric glands and it's mucosa. And between the glands there are layers of loose fibrous connective tissue, it's lamina propria. And deeper there is muscular uh, tissue, it's muscularis mucosa. So it's a micro relief of stomach, it's formed by gastric pits and gastric glands, it's a feature of stomach. And, um, Next layer of stomach, uh, it's uh, muscularis, and look at uh, muscularis. There is some mucosa and then muscularis. Muscularis, it has three layers instead of two. Uh, usually in intestines, in esophagus, there are two layers in a circular and outer longitudinal. And in stomach, there is one additional layer. Uh, it's the innermost layer, it's oblique, it's additional. Uh, why it's present there? Because uh, stomach it's also muscular organ and it should uh, mix the food which is present in stomach and those contractions they help in this they help to mix the food uh, and uh, that's why stomach it has well developed muscles in the middle layer. So there are three layers and inner is oblique and the outermost layer it's cirrhosa because stomach is covered by peritone. So it's structure of stomach. In body or fundus uh, there are gastric 
typical glands, uh, fundic glands or chief glands with well-developed parietal cells and chief cells. And in the pyloric region, there are pyloric glands with deeper pits. They are much deeper than in body. Uh, and also pyloric glands. Here we can see body of fundus are uh, small pits. And in the pyloric region, pits are deep. And uh, pyloric glands, they are coiled and they produce mainly mucus. Uh, and in body or fundus, uh, uh, Gastric glands, uh, they produce uh, hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen, uh, which are needed for the digestion. So here we can see that uh, epithelium, it provides the main function of the organ. In this case, it's production of gastric juice, and it's produced by the cells of epithelium. And the epithelium is specific in each organ. Uh, the next organ is intestine, and there is small and large intestine. So small intestine has uh, duodenum, digenum, and ileum. And uh, you already know that uh, the small intestine it has the simplest, the most typical structure. Uh, so let's look at the structure. In the duodenum, uh, there are four membranes. Mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and serosa, but in some places duodenum it has a peritoneal covering, it has a retroperitoneal localization, so uh, in those places duodenum it has adventitia instead of serosa. And epithelium, it's simple columnar epithelium, uh, under the epithelium there is lamina propria and muscularis mucosa, and uh, the duodenum it has villi and crypts, so it's micro relief of mucosa. Here we can see villi and crypts. And the feature of duodenum, uh, it's a uh, presence of the duodenal glands in submucosa. Here we can see duodenal or runner's glands in submucosa, which produce mucus, uh, which uh, is needed for the moistening of the uh, surface of uh, duodenal villi. And also this mucus, it protects uh, duodenal wall from the self-digestion, which may be caused by their own uh, enzymes uh, released from pancreas. Uh, and in the genome or ileum, those glands, they are absent, they disappear. And the denum, uh, it has uh, glands in the genome and ileum glands are absent by villi, but villi and crypts are present. And some mucosa is uh, having only connective tissue with different blood vessels and nerves. Epithelium of the genome and ileum is the same as in the duodenum. It's simple columnar epithelium. Uh, and the outermuscular usually it's serosa. In most places it's serosa. So, uh, jejunum and ileum, they have the most typical structure of the whole organ. And here we can see it. Uh, and in large intestine, what is the feature of the large intestine? It has, um, first of all, relief of large intestine is formed by crypts only. In small intestines, there are villi and crypts. In large intestine, uh, there are crypts only. Uh, and um, epithelium, also a simple columnar, but let's compare this epithelium and epithelium of the uh, small intestine. In small intestines, there are two kinds of cells. There are enterocytes, which provide absorption of different nutrients, and also goblet cells, which produce mucus. And in a uh, large intestine, the uh, number of the goblet cells increases compared to the digenum and ileum, and uh, absorption is reduced, and uh, large intestine produces, epithelium of large intestine produces uh, mucus, which is needed for the formation of fecal masses, and absorption is provided mainly by, uh, for water, uh, and uh, some substances also may be absorbed, but uh, usually absorption uh, is produced in large intestine. Another feature is muscularis. Here we can see muscularis of large intestine. Inner layer also is circular, outer is longitudinal, but the feature in large intestine is that outer layer is divided into tenia, into bundles. Uh, so there are three bundles. Uh, there are tenia coli, tenia libra, tenia omentalis, and inner layer isn't divided into bundles. So here we can see this feature. In small intestine, outer layer is continuous. In uh, large intestine, it's discontinuous and it's divided into three tenias. 
so here we can see three um, parts of the digestive tract: it's esophagus, stomach, and intestine. We can compare them. Uh, the most typical structure is present in intestine, and stomach features its additional inner oblique layer, uh, and in esophagus feature its uh, stratified squamous and keratinized epithelium, adventitia, and presence of skeletal muscles in uh, muscularis externa. Uh, and the uh, last part, uh, the lowest compartment of the digestive tract, it's rectum. And rectum also has some features of the structure. Uh, so here we can see structure of rectum in different parts. In the upper part of rectum, uh, it's similar to the structure of colon, to the structure of entire large intestine. So there is a simple glomerular epithelium, uh, mucosa, muscularis mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, which is composed of smooth muscles, and adventitia. Adventitia because uh, rectum goes to the pelvis and uh, retinum doesn't cover uh, lower parts of the rectum. Deeper rectum uh, has those changes. First of all, epithelium, uh, simple columnar epithelium, is replaced by stratified squamous and keratinized epithelium. This epithelium provides protection. Absorption is reduced in the rectum, uh, and the main function of rectum is transport of fecal masses of waste products, and uh, the epithelium is changed into stratified squamous and keratinized and then keratinized, uh, it transits into skin, and this epithelium protects underlying tissues, as well as epithelium in pharynx and esophagus. They need a protection, mechanical protection. Uh, deeper, uh, we can see that muscularis uh, mucosa disappears, and uh, muscular layer, it lost the outer layer, and also uh, outer anal sphincter, which is voluntary, it arises, uh, it is formed by the perineal muscles which uh, surround the rectum. So there are voluntary skeletal muscles. They form outer anal sphincter. And inner involuntary sphincter is formed by smooth muscles. And they, in the lower part, disappear and only voluntary sphincter is present here in the rectum. So we can control uh, sphincter of rectum. It's voluntary uh, muscle. Uh, and Histologically, it's straighted skeletal muscular tissue. And uh, here we can see three compartments of the digestive uh, system, uh, digestive tube, and uh, they have a lot of similarities uh, in their structure. So, anterior compartment, it includes uh, oral cavity, pharynx, and esophagus. Here we can see structure of those parts. Middle compartment, it's uh, gastrointestinal tract, it's stomach and intestines, and posterior compartment in the lowest third of the rectum. So let's make a summary of the digestive system. Anterior and posterior compartments, they are similar, and their features its presence of stratified squamous and keratinized epithelium, and skeletal muscles, uh, voluntary muscles in muscularis, and the outer layer is adventitia. Uh, epithelium is stratified squamous and keratinized because there is a, a main function of those uh, compartments. It's transport of food or waste products. Transport of food takes place in oral cavity, pharynx, and esophagus. Uh, and also waste products are uh, passing through the rectum. And uh, those um, mucosa or those organs, uh, they should have uh, uh, sick epithelium, uh, which will protect underlying tissues. And in middle compartment, epithelium is simple columnar to provide absorption of nutrients and to provide secretion of different uh, digestive enzymes and different mucuses uh, in different parts of the uh, digestive tract. Uh, also presence of uh, voluntary muscles, uh, skeletal muscles, uh, it's needed to control swallowing and to control defecation in posterior compartment. And uh, adventitia is present there uh, instead of cirrhosis because uh, they uh, should they uh, have this anatomical localization. They aren't covered by, by peritoneum, and uh, most organs of middle compartment they are covered by peritoneum. That's why they have cirrhosis. So here we can see structure of the organs of anterior, middle, and posterior compartments of the digestive tract. And now uh, let's 
look here we can see adventitia and cirrhosis of the, the digestive tract and middle compartment it mainly has cirrhosis because organs are covered by peritone and also organ which is uh, related to the digestive tract it's gallbladder uh, and it um, keeps gall uh, bile uh, and it's released into the small intestine into duodenum and gallbladder it also has structure of the hollow organ and it has three layers it's mucosa with simple columnar epithelium, it's muscularis and it's adventitia, it may be particularly covered by cirrhosa according to the localization of the uh, gallbladder and part of the gallbladder. So we can see here that submucosa is absent because mucosa is fixed to the underlying muscularis and muscular layer is oblique in the gallbladder. So here we can see mucosal folds, but they are immobile uh, and some mucosa is absent. They are fixed mucosal folds. They are mixed to the smooth muscular tissue of the middle layer. And now let's go to the uh, urinary system. It also has hollow organs. They form urinary tract, which is formed by two ureters, urinary bladder and urethra. It's urinary system. And let's look at typical structure of the organs of urinary system. And the most typical structure is present in the ureters. Here we can see ureters. And here we can see layered structure of ureter. Let's compare typical structure, for example, small intestine, which we have discussed before, and structure of ureter. So here we can see that ureter and urinary tract uh, there are also four membranes. It's mucosa, submucosa muscularis and mainly adventitia. So mucosa, let's compare layers of mucosa. In a typical structure, there are three layers. It's uh, epithelium, lamina propria and muscularis mucosa. In the urinary system, here we can see that muscularis mucosa is absent. So uh, it disappears in the urinary system. And urinary system, it has only epithelium and lamina propria. Uh, next feature of mucosa is epithelium. Uh, epithelium in the urinary system is transitional. Uh, it's, uh, this epithelium may be stretched and relaxed. It's stretched during the filling of the organ by urine. For example, urinary bladder, when it's filled with urine, the wall of uh, urinary bladder is stretched. And after the urination, uh, this wall is relaxed. And the cells, they can change their shape during the stretching and relaxation of the organ. So a specific epithelium which lines the urinary tract, it's called transitional epithelium or urocilium. Uh, next layer, it's submucosa. Here we can see the submucosa, it has features. And now let's look at muscularis. In typical organ, muscularis is composed of uh, smooth muscular tissue as well as in the urinary system. But what is specific here? In the urinary system, uh, the inner layer is longitudinal and outer is circular. So we can see here um, the uh, changed localization of the layers compared to the digestive system, compared to the typical localization. And the outermost layer, it's usually adventitia, but the uh, upper part of the urinary bladder is covered by peritoneum. So in those places, the urinary bladder, it has cirrhosa instead of adventitia. And here we can see structure of ureter. It's mucosa uh, lined by transitional epithelium and its lamina propria, and it transits into the submucosa, so we cannot see clear border between them and that's why in some textbooks you can find the information that submucosa is absent because of absence of muscularis mucosa. But mucosa of ureter is mobile, that's why we conclude that submucosa is present. Uh, it's a general decision to describe the layers. Uh, when mucosa is mobile, it means that submucosa is present because it provides mobility of mucosa above the underlying muscularis. Uh, muscularis, it has two layers, inner is longitudinal, outer is circular, uh, and uh, the outermost layer is adventitia. And uh, here we can see, for example, two organs which may be similar on the transverse sections, and uh, they uh, are often confused by students. It's esophagus and ureter. So here we can see how to distinguish them. 
First of all, let's look at the epithelium in esophagus. It's squamous, certified squamous, and ureter it's transitional. So uh, superficial cells, uh, they have a um, uh, round surface. Uh, it's uh, uh, located in the uh, urinary system, in the ureter. Next, uh, in the esophagus, uh, muscularis mucosa is present in ureter, it's absent, so this layer it disappears. In some mucosa uh, of esophagus, there are uh, glands, proper glands, and in ureter they are absent. And uh, layers of muscularis in the esophagus inner layer, it's circular, outer is longitudinal, and in the ureter, uh, in ureter we can see opposite localization, inner is longitudinal and outer is circular. And here we can see those organs, so we can compare them. And here we can see ureter, and another organ of the urinary tract, it's urinary bladder. So let's compare urinary bladder to the ureter. First of all, uh, what we can see is that it's the uh, structure of muscularis. Urinary bladder it also has mucosa, it's transitional epithelium and lamina propria, some mucosa. And muscularis, it's composed of three layers instead of two. And those layers are oblique. Here we can see those oblique layers. And the outermost layer, it's particularly adventitia and particularly serosa in those places where urinary bladder is covered by peritone. So here we can see structure of urinary bladder. And urethra is similar to the ureter, uh, but it has some features in female and male organism. In female organism, it is shorter. Uh, and uh, also in female organism, transitional epithelium transits uh, directly into certified squamous non keratinized epithelium and then into skin. In male organism, there is more complex transition from transitional epithelium to the simple columnar and after that it transits into the certified columnar and certified chromosome keratinized and then keratinized. So uh, there is more uh, complex transition of the epithelium. And now let's go to the uh, organs of reproductive systems and we'll begin from female reproductive system. And you know that female reproductive system it has glands, ovaries, they are solid or parenchymal organs, and also this system it has reproductive tract hollow organs. They are fallopian tubes or oviducts, uterus, and vagina. And female reproductive system it has three layers uh, instead of uh, four. So uh, female reproductive system it has mucosa, muscularis, and serosa or adventitia. Some mucosa is absent in female reproductive tract. It's first feature of female reproductive system. Usually mucosal folds or mucosal structures, they are fixed to the underlying muscularis. The most typical structure in the female reproductive system is present in the fallopian or uterine tube. Here we can see it. It has mucosa, which is composed of a simple columnar epithelium, ciliated and uh, lamina propria and muscularis mucosa is absent in this case. Note that if uh, submucosa is absent, muscularis mucosa always is absent. And uh, muscularis is uh, located directly under the lamina propria. So uh, mucosa of the female reproductive tract is composed of only two layers. It's uh, epithelium and lamina propria. Epithelium in the fallopian tube, it's uh, simple columnar, ciliated, and uh, lamina propria underlies this epithelium. Middle layer, it's muscularis, and uh, it's composed of smooth muscular uh, tissue. And the outermost layer of the fallopian tube, it's serosa, because fallopian tubes, they are covered by peritone. Uh, so, if we compare typical organ and uh, typical organ of the female reproductive system, we can see that uh, muscularis, uh, mucosa and some mucosa they disappear, but in other layers they have typical structure without any features. Epithelium uh, in fallopian tube is ciliated, but also there are secretory cells, so it's a feature of the structure of the fallopian or uterine tube. And also in the next organ of the female reproductive tract, it's uterus. It has also three layers: it's mucosa, muscularis, and serosa. They have all names which are 
used in uh, clinical practice in gynecology. Mucosa is called endometrium, mucosa, uh, muscularis is called myometrium, and uh, serosa is called perimetrium. Here we can see mucosa of the uterus. It's composed of simple columnar epithelium and thin layer of loose fibrous connective tissue, it's lamina propria. And epithelium in uterus, it forms glands. They are simple tubular unbranched glands. And mucosa is divided into two compartments according to their changes during the menstrual cycle. Upper part is the functional layer and lower part is basal layer. Uh, some mucosa is absent in uterus and muscularis is composed of three layers. It's smooth muscular tissue and middle layer it contains big blood vessels which uh, are uh, compressed by the muscles uh, during the delivery to prevent bleeding. And the outermost layer is serosa because uterus is covered by uh, peritoneum uh, and it's serosa. But uh, the place near the cervix of uterus where serosa is absent, uh, there is an adventitia near the cervix and this place is called parametrium. It's located uh, near the cervix. The next organ of the female reproductive tract is vagina. Here we can see vagina and uh, vagina, it has also mucosa, muscularis, and adventitia. Uh, and mucosa of vagina, it has stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium, so it's thicker than in the uh, uterus and fallopian tubes to provide mechanical protection. And this epithelium is located in vagina, and also it covers the vaginal portion of the cervix of uterus. Uh, middle layer, it's muscularis, it's smooth muscular tissue, it's involuntary. And the outermost layer, it's uh, adventitia, because vagina isn't covered by peritone. And also vagina is surrounded by the uh, perineal muscles, which form um, sphincter, it's voluntary sphincter, which surrounds uh, the vagina. So uh, vagina is a little bit similar to the rectum. Rectum uh, has uh, stratified in the lowest part. Uh, it's, it has stratified squamous and keratinized epithelium as well as in the vagina. Then muscularis, uh, all in muscularis, which has uh, smooth muscular tissue involuntary. In rectum, it forms inner involuntary sphincter. And adventitia, which is surrounded by the perineal voluntary muscles. They are skeletal uh, voluntary striated, uh, striated muscles. So here we can see structure of vagina. And now let's uh, revise structure of the organs of male reproductive system. And uh, hollow organs of male reproductive system, they form seminiferous tract. It's a system of tubules uh, which provide uh, passageway for spermatozoa after their production in the testes. Uh, spermatozoa pass through the seminiferous tract. There are intratesticular parts of the seminiferous tract and then they uh, come to the ductus efferentis, to the epididymis, uh, to the ductus or vas deferens. Then there is a ductus eaculatorius and also there are seminal vesicles uh, which release here uh, fluid. Uh, it's ductus eaculatorius which is opened into the male urethra. So male urethra is the last part of the male reproductive tract or seminiferous tract. And note that male urethra uh, is the organ, at the same time it's the organ of uh, urinary and male reproductive system. So here we can see vas deferens. Uh, it's the most typical organ of the male uh, seminiferous tract. It has three layers. It's mucosa, muscularis, and adventitia. Here we can see mucosa, muscularis, and adventitia. And let's look at the features. So mucosa, lining of mucosa, it's columnar epithelium, but this epithelium is pseudo-certified. It has appearance which is like a certified epithelium. So there are some rows of the nuclei, there are basal cells and tall ciliated cells, and this epithelium is ciliated columnar pseudo-certified. Deeper, uh, we can see muscularis under the mucosa uh, epithelium, lamina propria uh, mucosa. Some mucosa is absent. Note that in the female and male reproductive tract, some mucosa is absent. And uh, muscularis is located under uh, the mucosa, directly under the mucosa. 
uh, and muscularis uh, is composed in vast difference uh, is composed of three layers because uh, it uh, is working actively to move the spermatozoa so those cristatic movements are needed to move spermatozoa and to release them into outer environment uh, and there are three layers of muscularis inner and outer are longitudinal and middle uh, is circular and the outermost uh, layer it's adventitia, uh, which covers the vast difference. Uh, and also in other organs of the tract, tract, uh, in other tubules, uh, they have similar, similar structure to the vast difference. So uh, here we can see convoluted seminifrous tubules, straight tubules, uh, which carry spermatozoa to the red testis. From red testis, uh, spermatozoa are coming to ductally efferentes, which are opened into uh, ductus uh, or into duct of the epididymis, and it's continued by the vas deferens. And uh, the organs of seminiferous tract, they also have uh, mucosa, muscularis, and adventitia. So mucosa is composed of simple columnar epithelium and uh, lamina propria, or this epithelium may be different in different parts uh, according to the features of those organs. Muscularis, uh, it's a simple uh, layer, single layer of the smooth myocytes, and the outer layer is uh, adventitia because uh, tubules of this miniferous tract, they aren't covered by the peritone. So in the ductally efferentes, uh, this uh, epithelium, it has two kinds of cells, tall ciliated cells and short um, secretory cells. That's why uh, the inner lining of the ductally efferentes uh, has wavy contour. There are tall uh, cells and short cells and contour is wavy. Uh, Next layer, it's muscularis, here we can see it, and the outer adventitia transits into adventitia of the neighboring ductally efferentes. In the uh, ductus epididymidis, the epithelium is pseudocertified columnar ciliated, similar to those in the ductus deferens. Uh, muscularis is thin, it's located here, and the outermost layer is adventitia. And uh, if you compare uh, ductally efferentes to the um, ductus epididymidis, you can see that ductally efferentes they have baby contour, and ductus epididymidis it has smooth contour, or smooth inner line. And also uh, in the ductally um, in the red testis and in the straight seminiferous tubules, epithelium is simple uh, in the uh, seminiferous tubules, straight seminiferous tubules. Epithelium is uh, columnar and its red testis uh, epithelium is uh, thinner, cells become to be uh, cuboid or even squamous. Uh, it's epithelium in the red testis. Uh, but in other layers are similar uh, to uh, entire uh, plan of the structure of the seminiferous tract. And uh, also there are convoluted seminiferous tubules. They are structural and functional units of testis. They form parenchyma of testis, but they have tubular or luminal structure. And also they have layers of the blood. Here we can see convoluted seminiferous tubule, and it has uh, the following layers. The innermost layer is um, seminiferous spermatogenic epithelium, here we can see spermatogenic epithelium, which provides spermatogenesis. Uh, there are spermatogenic cells, uh, progenitors of spermatozoa, they are located here. Under this layer, uh, it's basal layer, it's composed of basal membrane and thin layer of connective tissue. So this layer is similar to the lamina propria, so epithelium and lamina propria, and in convoluted uh, seminiferous tubules there is spermatogenic epithelium and basal layer. Next layer is myoid layer. Uh, it's composed of modified uh, connective tissue or muscular cells, which have ability co for contractions, so there are special myoid cells. And this layer is similar to the muscular layer, so here we can see. And the outer layer, it's fibrous layer. It's composed of collagen and elastic fibers, and this layer uh, is similar to the adventitia. So uh, spermatogenic epithelium and basal layers, they correspond to mucosa, 
Myoid layer, it corresponds to the muscularis, and uh, fibrous layer, it corresponds to adventitia. Four layers are present in the convoluted smooth tubules, spermatogenic epithelium, basal, myoid, and fibrous layers. And uh, also, we have discussed uh, different organs uh, which have typical structure for their systems. And among them, we can find and describe bag-like hollow organs. Uh, they have uh, lumen, they have wall, and this wall, it forms structure like bag. So, first of all, uh, it's uh, the gallbladder. Here we can see this gallbladder. It has bottom, it has body and neck, which is opened into the duct. So, it's the uh, gallbladder. And we already know the structure, it has mucosa, muscularis, and adventitia or particular serosa. And feature of this organ is oblique orientation of muscles. In gallbladder muscles, they have oblique orientation to provide release of the content. When gallbladder is contracted, uh, these oblique muscles, they push out inner content of gallbladder and it's released into the duct. Uh, so. Uh, Inner content is bile, and uh, the oblique orientation of muscles is needed to release those uh, content. Uh, the next uh, organ, bag like organ, is urinary bladder. The inner content of urinary bladder is urine, and when urinary bladder is contracted, it pushes out urine into urethra. And also, here we can see uh, oblique orientation of smooth muscles in the middle layer. Here we can see them. Uh, so, uh, it has well-developed muscles, which provide urination. Uh, it's musculus detrusor vesitze. When those muscles are contracted, they provide uh, urination. And the uh, last bag-like hollow organ, it's uterus. Uh, also, it has bag-like structure, it has bottom, it has walls, so it's body, and uh, uterus, it provides very important function, it provides development of embryos and fetus uh, during intrauterine period of life, and here we can see this structure, uh, and during the delivery, uterus pushes out baby into the uh, cervix and vagina, and uh, it's provided by muscularis. And this muscular is always also it has oblique orientation of smooth muscles. So here we can see we can find the common features of the muscularis of those bag like uh, hollow organs. So here we can see the structure of the uterus. And um, also organ which is similar to the hollow organs, it's organ of the cardiovascular system, it's heart. And heart, it has some features of the structure. So heart, it belongs to the cardiovascular system and the innermost layer of heart, uh, it's uh, similar to the blood vessels. So it's lined by the endocilium and uh, this endocilium, this thin layer of uh, connective tissue, uh, they form uh, intima, it's tunica intima of the uh, heart. Uh, and uh, this layer, it's endocardium. So endocardium of heart, it has thin layer of endocelial cells, it's simple squamous epithelium, sub-endocelial layer, then thin layer of smooth myocytes, and a thin layer of connective tissue. So endocardium particularly is similar to the mucosa and submucosa of another organs, but important feature that there is an endocelium and sub-endocelial layer instead of epithelium and lamina propria. Uh, and uh, this layer structure is similar to the vein. Uh, so endocardium, it corresponds to the vein. Muscular layer of heart, it's called myocardium, and it's composed of cardiac muscular uh, tissue. Here we can see cardiac muscular tissue, it's composed of cardiac myocytes, and it's a uh, muscular layer. And the outer layer of heart, it's epicardium, it's visceral layer of pericardium, and also there is a parietal layer of pericardium. And those layers, uh, they are covered by mesocilium, simple squamous epithelium, and underlying connective tissue uh, is located under these layers. So it's serosa. We can uh, describe uh, epicardium and pericardium as serosa of heart. So here we can see 
it's the inner layer of heart, it's endocardium. Uh, it has uh, endothelium, subendothelial layer, and it's a uh, thin layer of sposphyocytes and a uh, layer of connective tissue, it's endocardium. It's muscular layer, it's myocardium. It's epicardium, cirrhosa of heart, and parietal layer of cirrhosa uh, of pericardium. It's uh, pericardium or heart back. Uh, here we can see it, the structure of heart. So features of heart. Uh, endocardium, myocardium, and epicardium, special names. And also endocardium, it has simple uh, squamous epithelium, which is called um, endocilium. And this endocilium is present everywhere into the cardiovascular system. So the common lining of all organs and vessels of cardiovascular system is endocardium. Uh, and uh, endocardium, it's endocilium. And endocardium, uh, it has a um, layer which, it has structure which is similar to the structure of vein. So it's a physiological structure of heart. Uh, and here we can see the layers of heart. And uh, we have described and discussed the organs of uh, visceral systems, which have a mucosa, sometimes they have submucosa. Uh, middle layer, it's muscularis, and the outer, it's uh, serosa or adventitia, and the last uh, visceral system, which also has uh, hollow organs, it's respiratory system. And respiratory system, it has a respiratory tract, uh, and also parenchymal organ, uh, it's uh, parenchymal organs are lungs, and in other organs, they are hollow and they form respiratory tract. And it begins as a nasal cavity, uh, then uh, pharynx, which is common for uh, respiratory and digestive systems, then larynx, trachea, bronchi, extrapulmonary, intrapulmonary bronchi, and then they are followed by the smallest uh, bronchi, which are called bronchioli, bronchioles. So here we can see respiratory tract. And respiratory tract, it has features of the structure. The first feature of the respiratory system is middle layer. Here we can see it. Usually, middle layer of the hollow organs it's muscular tissue. Usually, it's smooth muscular, but sometimes it's voluntary skeletal muscular uh, tissue. But in respiratory system, uh, there is a fibrocartilaginous layer instead of muscular tissue. Uh, because peristalsis is absent in respiratory system, uh, but uh, respiratory tract needs maintenance uh, by the um, uh, tissues and structures uh, which are located here, uh, special cartilage, etc. So they provide uh, maintenance of the shape and lumen of the respiratory tract remains open. We don't need contraction of muscles. We need uh, open passageway of the respiratory system. Uh, and here we can see uh, this uh, cartilaginous, fibrocartilaginous layer, which is uh, like skeleton of the respiratory tract. It maintains the shape of the uh, organs of respiratory system. Uh, so it's a uh, feature which differs respiratory system from another organs. Uh, in other features, uh, layers of the respiratory system, uh, it has uh, four layers. The innermost layer uh, is mucosa, and mucosa of respiratory system is composed of three layers. It's epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis. So this mucosa is similar to the mucosa of uh, digestive system. And epithelium is specific. Uh, it's uh, pseudo-certified columnar ciliated. This type of epithelium is characteristic for the respiratory tract, so sometimes this epithelium is called respiratory epithelium. There are ciliated cells and copied cells, they provide mucosillary clearance of the respiratory tract. Uh, copied cells, they produce mucus, and cilia, they move this layer of mucus with attached particles of dust, of bacteria, etc. So they provide clearance of the uh, respiratory system. Underlying layer, it's uh, lamina propria, which is similar to another uh, parts of the uh, hollow organs. Uh, so it's similar to the uh, lamina propria of another hollow organs. 
And the next layer is muscularis mucosa. It's a simple, smooth muscular uh, tissue which is present here. But uh, look here, um, respiratory system, it hasn't muscularis, but it has muscularis mucosa. So muscles are present in respiratory system, but only in mucosa, as muscularis mucosa. And this muscularis mucosa has ability for contraction and contractions of uh, muscularis mucosa in the respiratory system, they result in the contractions and changes of folds of uh, mucosa. Next layer, it's submucosa. So submucosa is present in respiratory system. Submucosa is present in uh, digestive, in urinary and respiratory systems. And it has mucous glands, which produce mucus, which is released on the surface of the epithelium. Uh, next layer, you already know this layer, it's fibrocartilaginous layer. This layer is present here instead of muscularis, and it maintains the shape. Usually it's uh, hyaline cartilage covered by dense fibrous connective tissue, but sometimes uh, there is an elastic uh, cartilage, especially in the larynx. Some cartilages are made up of elastic cartilage, and the smallest bronchi, they also may have elastic cartilaginous tissue here. And the outermost layer always is adventitia because bronchi, they aren't covered by peritoneum and also trachea, larynx, they haven't peritoneal covering. So the outermost layer is adventitia. Um, and here we can see histological slide, it's drawing of trachea, it's mucosa, it's stratified epithelium and lamina propria. In trachea, muscularis mucosa isn't uh, uh, well developed, so it's uh, almost invisible here. Next layer is submucosa. It has glands which produce mucus and serous secret. And next layer is fibrocartilaginous layer. Here we can see cartilage and fibrous membrane. And the outermost layer is adventitia, which may contain adipose tissue, blood vessels, and nerves. So it uh, surrounds uh, this uh, whole organs of respiratory system. And let's compare digestive and respiratory system. So mucosa are almost the same, but the feature is specific type of epithelium. Some mucosa of respiratory system is similar to the digestive system. Middle layer is different. Uh, muscularis here and fibrocartilaginous in respiratory system. And the outermost layer in respiratory system is always adventitia. In digestive system, it may be both types, uh, adventitia or cirrhosis. Uh, and here we can see its histological slide, which shows both uh, organs of both systems. It's trachea, which is located near the esophagus. It's a transverse section of the neck of the laboratory animal. And here we can see its section of the esophagus. It has uh, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis, and adventitia. And its respiratory system is trachea. And we can see that their adventitia are rich with adipose tissue, and they transit into each other. So there are uh, places where adventitia are fused, adventitia of two organs. And here we can see the digestive system, its uh, picture it shows the esophagus and its respiratory system. And feature of trachea, uh, it's the uh, shape of the cartilage. So cartilage on the posterior wall, uh, they aren't closed, they have C-like shape. And on the posterior wall uh, of trachea, they form they are connected by the fibrous membrane, which also may contain a small amount of smooth myocytes. And uh, here we can see this. It's needed to provide passageway for food through the esophagus. Uh, esophagus usually is collapsed and respiratory system, it's not collapsed. It remains open because of cartilage. And when food passes through the esophagus, this flexible uh, and stretchable wall, posterior wall of trachea, it provides passageway for the food through the esophagus. Food, food passes through the esophagus without um, damage of trachea, and this flexible wall of trachea, it uh, gives more space for food inside the esophagus. And uh, bronchi, they are similar to trachea. They also have uh, mucosa with epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis. They have uh, submucosa fibrocartilaginous layer and adventitia. And according to their structure, we divide bronchi into three groups. 
Zrath large, middle and small bronchi. Large bronchi, they have this structure. They uh, have big cartilaginous plates or cartilaginous rings. They are uh, principal bronchi, left and right, uh, which enter in left and right lungs. And also uh, lower bronchi, they belong to large. They have cartilaginous plates. Middle bronchi, uh, segmental, subsegmental bronchi, they are middle. They have cartilaginous eyelids uh, in the fibrocartilaginous layer. And those eyelids, they are connected by the uh, fibrous membranes. That's why this layer is called fibrocartilaginous, not only cartilaginous, because fibrous tissue always uh, is present here. And small bronchi, they have small cartilaginous eyelids, very, very small. And uh, in some cases, they are invisible because section passes uh, without sectioning of the cartilaginous eyelids. So on the histological slides, in some places, they may be absent. Uh, those cartilaginous eyelids in small bronchi. And here we can see layered structure of large, middle, and small bronchus. And let's look. Uh, layers are the same. Mucosa with epithelium, lamina propria, and muscularis. Uh, submucosa, fibrocartilaginous layer, and adventitia. But let's compare the uh, layers. First of all, epithelium. Thickness of epithelium gradually decreases with decrease of the diameter of bronchus. Here we can see gradual decrease of thickness of uh, epithelium. Uh, and the same we can see here in the lamina propria. Thickness of lamina propria decreases. But let's look at the muscularis. Muscularis mucosa. It's not muscularis externa, it's muscularis mucosa. Uh, is not well developed in trachea and large bronchi, but its thickness increases in small bronchi. So small bronchi, they have well developed muscularis mucosa. And uh, it may result in their bronchospasm, spasm, contraction of bronchi. And uh, it may occur in the bronchial asthma, in different diseases of uh, small bronchi. So uh, you should know it has very uh, big clinical relevance for you uh, that small bronchi, they have ability for contraction and for bronchospasm. And if bronchospasm occurs, it's a result of the contraction of muscularis mucosa in small bronchi. So different medicines uh, which um, remove this contraction of these muscles should be prescribed. Uh, and the target cells will be smooth myocytes of small bronchi. And large bronchi, they have an ability for bronchospasm of two reasons. Uh, because of uh, thin layer of smooth myocytes, poor development of muscles. And another reason, it's well-developed skeleton, cartilaginous skeleton, uh, which uh, maintains the shape of large bronchi. So they always remain open. Uh, Submucosa always uh, also gradually decreases in thickness. Uh, cartilaginous layer it changes the shape. Cartilaginous rings and cartilaginous plates are present in large bronchi, middle bronchi. They have cartilaginous eyelids, and small cartilaginous eyelids are present in small bronchi. And adventitia also gradually decreases in thickness. So here we can see gradual decrease in thickness of all layers except muscularis mucosa, which increases in thickness in small bronchi. And uh, bronchi, they transit into bronchioles, and uh, bronchioles, uh, they are described as the smallest bronchi, but the changes aren't uh, quantitative, they also are qualitative. Uh, so what are the changes? First of all, uh, goblet cells, they disappear, which were present in bronchi, and bronchioles, they have clara cells or secretory cells, which produce surfactant, and goblet cells, they disappear. Also, uh, mucous glands of some mucosa, they disappear, so uh, bronchioles, they haven't sources of mucous production, they haven't uh, goblet cells and uh, mucous glands, they have only uh, clara cells which produce surfactant and it provides uh, protection, uh, it prevents uh, of collapsing of bronchioles. And also cartilage, they completely disappear in bronchioles. So bronchioles, they have this uh, skeleton, cartilaginous skeleton, uh, that's why they don't need mucus because it's uh, um, viscous and it may cause collapsing of bronchioles. They have surfactant covering 
the epithelium and it prevents collapsing of bronchioles as well as collapsing of the alveoli in the respiratory portion of the lungs, in the following ones. Uh, so here we can see the structure of bronchiole. It's epithelium, lamina propria, muscularis, and uh, it's submucosa, fiber cartilaginous layer, now it's fibers, and outer layer is adventitia. Those layers are formed by fibrous connective tissue, so they are fused. And it's structure of bronchiole. And here we can see bronchus and its bronchiole. Both have well developed smooth muscles, small bronchus and uh, bronchiole. But cartilage plates, they completely disappear in bronchioles, as well as glands, as well as goblet cells. But uh, clara cells, which produce surfactant, they appear in the bronchioles. So it's how to distinguish bronchus and bronchiole on the histological slide. Uh, so, students, uh, we have discussed all the hollow organs uh, and we uh, see that they have a lot of similarities in their structure and there are some differences and we should look at the features of the uh, layers of the wall. And next time we'll talk about structure of the parenchymal or solid organs. So, students, that's all and thank you for your attention.